Today we're continuing the series that we've been in called Spiritual Fitness. Spiritual Fitness. Last week we unpacked the importance uh, and, the, and the base uh, of our text, the importance of spiritual fitness by looking at 1, Thessal- or 1 Timothy chapter 4, 7, and 8. This is what Paul told Timothy. This is the base text for this series. He said this, Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, Rather, train yourselves for godliness. Train yourselves for godliness. Then he says this, while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, and it holds promise for the present life and the life to come. So what the Apostle Paul is saying is, it's good to take care of our physical bodies, but we can't neglect training our soul. We can't neglect training our soul, training for godliness. The word train comes from the word gymnazo, where we get our modern word gymnasium from. And, and as followers of Jesus, we're encouraged to train ourselves for the purpose of of godliness, the purpose of godliness. Now, I shared a quote last week, and I'm going to share it again just as a refresher, a reminder, from a book by Richard Foster called The Celebration of Discipline. And uh, he writes this, God has given us the disciplines of the spiritual life as a means of receiving his grace. So we know that we're saved by grace, right? At the same time, we grow because of the grace of God. We grow in grace. And and as a means of receiving that grace, there are certain spiritual disciplines that God gives us. He goes on to say, the disciplines allow us to place ourselves before God so that he can transform us. So while the disciplines don't save us, the disciplines put us in a position where we can receive what we need from God to be able to grow in godliness. Now, how many of you want to be transformed by the Lord this year? How many want to be transformed by the Lord? I think every hand ought to be up. There are some of you already falling asleep on me. It's important to understand if we want to grow and be transformed, we've got to train for the purpose of godliness. We've got, to, we've got to develop some disciplines, we hate that word disciplines, or some, a better way, healthy habits that position us to be in a place where we can be transformed by the grace of God. And today I want to unpack a spiritual discipline, and, uh, and so today we're going to talk about developing a prayer habit. Developing a prayer habit, developing a habit of prayer. Now, I, I, when, I, when I look at prayer, you, you might say to yourself, well, <laughs> uh, you know, what about prayer? That's easy, right? That's simple. I, I think prayer is, 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 is something simple yet difficult. I, I think it's simple yet it's, it's difficult. I think it's something that we talk a lot about, but we don't practice a lot. It's something that I think that if you've been a believer, you would say, amen, pastor, prayer is important. But if I were to ask you, how much time do you spend each week outside of Sunday morning service praying? How, much, how, how many of you would, would your calendar, where your time say you prioritize the habit of prayer in your life? Ouch. Don't go there, pastor. Right? Right? Don't go there, Pastor. Habits are important. And and there's a sense in which you are your habits. Those things that you do repeatedly. A habit is is kind of an an automated behavior that we repeat over and over again in the same context or environment. Now, can I be transparent and tell on myself for a moment? I'm a person of habits. So much so that uh, in our family we have a dog. and, And our dog is named Tucker. And I am so habit-driven that if I'm not following the pattern that I normally follow, my dog will indicate to me when he believes it's time for us to go to bed by going into his place. He's got a little kennel, and that's where he goes at night. And he will go in there and wait on his treat for me if at the time I normally go to bed, I'm not in bed. Seriously. He, it, it, it is such a, it, there is such a routine in my life that he, he, there are certain activities, certain things he hears. If I go to, to get the dishwasher ready at night, he knows, and he just goes. He's just right there and ready. Why? Because there's a habit. It's just something that, that does it normally. Now, let me tell you something. You all have habits too. How many of you have your morning routine? 
it's what you do. When you get up, it's what you do. It's, it's just a part of it. You can, you can like, like clockwork. And when you don't do it, it throws you off. You just feel like your whole day, there's just something off. That, that is the value of, of habits. And, and, and if, you wanna, if you wanna see your life transformed, then you've got to develop new habits. You've got to change your habits. You've got to change your habits. In fact, uh, speaking on the importance of, of habits, uh, uh, pastor and, and, and speaker Rich Wilkerson Jr. defines the importance of a habit. What I do daily becomes what I do permanently. What I do daily becomes what I do permanently. God loves us enough that, that, that he invites us into a lifestyle of life-giving habits. These are the, the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines that he puts in his word for us because they are life-giving and life-transforming to us. They're to us. They're patterns of thinking and doing and being. And when they're built into our lives and they become a habit, a, an automated behavior, a part of who we are, they lead to spiritual vitality. And so today I want to talk about the habit of prayer. I want to talk about the habit of prayer. And like I said, prayer seems simple in nature, yet it's not always easy in practice. In fact, F.B. Meyer put it this way. He's the author of a great little book called The Secret of Guidance. And, 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 and this is just, I love this quote. The great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Ouch! Right? Ouch! I think sometimes when it, when it comes to prayer, we look at prayer like that little glass box up on the wall and, that says break in case of emergency. You know what I'm talking about? And while it is important in a crisis that we turn to prayer, prayer is much more than something that we do in a crisis. Prayer is about a daily habit of communing with God, of, of talking to God. In fact, I heard the story the other day about a, a man who had encountered some trouble while he was uh, flying. He, 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 he called the control tower from his little airplane and he said, pilot to tower, I'm 300 miles from the airport, 600 feet above ground and I'm out of fuel. I'm descending rapidly, please advise. Over. He hurried back, tower to pilot. Repeat after me. Our Father who art in heaven, <laughs> in a crisis, we turn to prayer. But prayer is much more than something we ought to turn to in a crisis. Prayer needs to be a habit in our lives because prayer is one of the most untapped resources, unexplored continent, uh, unexplored resources on the continent where an untold treasure remains unearthed. Unearthed. And I think if we practice anything, one of the gifts that we need to learn how to practice is the habit of prayer. In his book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, author and pastor Jim Cimbala, a former pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, points out that before Christ, before David, before even Moses organized a formal worship system with the tabernacle, there was prayer. And he points out Genesis chapter 4, 25 and 26, and, and it records this, Adam lay with his wife again. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel. Remember, Cain had killed Abel. Since Cain killed him, Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. And here's where it is. At that time, men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Before then, they had known God as creator. Now they began to personalize God as they began to call on him as creator. And while Cain and his inhabitants started to go a different direction, started to move away from God, it was Seth and his son Enosh and their generation that distinguished themselves from everyone else on the earth as they began to call upon the name of the Lord. Prayer distinguishes us as God's people because it is a habit in our lives in which we call upon the name of the Lord. There's something powerful about calling on God's name. Before there was a, a, a Bible was available, before a preacher was ever ordained or the first church service was ever formed, a godly strain of men and women distinguished themselves from their ungodly neighbors by calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord. To those who call upon the name of the Lord, it means to cry out, to implore aid. And this, in essence, is a true prayer that touches the very heart of God. 
Famous preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, the best style of prayer is that which cannot be anything else but a cry. God wants us to cry out to him. God invites us to commune with him. God invites us to call out to him. Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and unsearchable things that you do not know, which you do not know. We, we need things that we don't know, things that we can't pick up in the natural. We're going to get into this. I don't want to get ahead. But God invites us to call out to him. He invites us to call out to him. In fact, after Moses had come down from Mount Sinai, calling on God became an earmark of success within the nation of Israel. Moses' farewell address, he makes this statement in Deuteronomy 4, 7. What other nation is so great as to have their God so near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? As believers in Jesus Christ, as followers, as disciples of Jesus, we have this incredible, incredible gift that we have been given. And it's the gift to be able to call out and call upon the name of the Lord. To commune with God. To commune with God. No other nation at that time, they may have had, the other nations may have had better chariots and they may have had better better weapons, but that didn't matter when it came to the battles when they came up against Israel because there was nothing that could overcome Israel's God. There was no one. There was nothing. God responded as they cried out to him. So today I want to talk about five reasons that it is important to develop a prayer habit. Five reasons that it's important to develop a prayer habit. First of all, prayer was a habit that was modeled by Jesus. Prayer was a habit that was modeled by Jesus. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. A certain place. Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. As the text opens in Luke chapter 11, where do we find Jesus? Do we find him teaching? Do we find him doing miracles? Where do we find Jesus? We find him praying in a certain place. And one of his disciples is observing this so much so that when he watches Jesus pray, he says, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And this was not a one-time occurrence for Jesus. In fact, if you go back just in, in the book of Luke, you will see that there is a pattern of prayer even before Luke chapter 11. Luke 3, 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And here it is. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. How many would love to have an open heaven? As he was praying, heaven was open. Perhaps we don't have the, the openness of heaven over our homes, over our lives, over our families, over our city, because we haven't developed a habit of prayer. I'll leave that there. Luke 6, 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. Luke 6, 12. Luke 9, 18. Once when Jesus was praying in, a, in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Once when Jesus was praying. Luke 9, 29, now it came to pass about eight days after these, saying that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. Wow. Wow. He went on the mountain to pray. He went on the mountain to pray. Jesus had a habit of prayer. This is just the book of Luke, all before Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. And there are verses that follow, and I don't want to just repeat verse after verse after verse. But in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over and over and over again, you see that Jesus modeled the importance of prayer. And if Jesus, the Son of God, who had come in human flesh, valued and said prayer, a prayer habit was important and modeled it for us, how much more so us who are not the Son of God? How much more us? How much more us? 
The disciples who watched Jesus pray felt insufficient when it came to understanding how to pray. Therefore, I know that prayer is simple, yet it's difficult in practice. And so what do they do? They, they lead us to the second uh, reason prayer is important is because the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. That's the second one. A prayer habit was taught by Jesus. In response to this request, he didn't say, no, <laughs> sorry, not going to teach you how to pray. He didn't say, oh, come on now. Why are you asking me that? It's simple. All you got to do is just talk to God, right? Again, that is in simple. It should be simple. It is in simple, but it's, it's so difficult in, in practice. It's so difficult in in practice, and so what does Jesus do? Jesus begins to teach them how to pray, and he begins to, to give them this, this pattern of prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. That's what we know it as, the, the Lord's Prayer. Luke has a little bit of a different version. Matthew goes into a lot more detail. But the Lord's Prayer is not just something that we recite and that we memorize. What Jesus is giving and teaching is that prayer is a pattern. There is a pattern to prayer. If you're going to develop a habit of prayer, you can, you can see that throughout Scripture there are patterns to prayer. So let's read it. Luke 11, 2 through 4, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves, uh, excuse me, uh, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So in response to this pattern, what does Jesus open up with? He, he opens up with adoration. Adoration. Adoration is to adore. Adoration is worship. Adoration is, is, is the wonder and to begin with the wonder and the awe and the worship of God. Notice that, 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 that he uses the word hallowed. It means holy or sacred. To treat as sacred or ultimately supreme. It, 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 it's, it's what we make the most crucial or supreme aim of our life. When we approach, although prayer is, is simple, we have to understand that God is also holy. That when you are praying, it is a sacred moment, a sacred time with God. You're not rushing in to the presence of God demanding something, but you come into the presence of God recognizing who He is and the power that He holds. It's recognizing the holiness of God. Now let me back up for a moment. Because he also uses another term, Father, 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 hallowed be your name. Now, Father is an intimate term. Father is an intimate term. It's a, it's, it's a term in which a, a child uh, looks at their parent, their male parent, and says, Father, Father, Daddy. And, and, and there, there's something intimate about this. And so you, you have this juxtaposition in prayer right from the beginning where Jesus says that we can have this intimacy with God, this intimate relationship with God, calling him Father, yet don't forget that he is also holy. There's something important about the intimate part of God. I have children. I remember when they were younger. They're a lot older now and they don't do this anymore. Uh, but when they were little... And they'd come up and they wanted my attention. They'd say, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And they'd lift up their hands and I'd, I'd pick them up. And when I'm, when I'm here at church, oftentimes I'm in a conversation. So I might be holding them. And I remember if I'm in a conversation and they want to get my attention, they'd take their little hands, they'd put them on my little cheeks, and they would move my face towards them. They wanted to see my face. That's the intimacy. That's the intimacy. And see, when you and I begin to pray, and we, we take the posture of children with our Father, and we lift up our hands, and we take a hold of His face, and we say, oh, oh, look at me. Face to face. That's the kind of encounter that we can have through prayer. It's intimate. But let's also remember that it's not simply casual, because I think that sometimes we can cease to honor God as God, that he is also holy, that he is also holy and he is sacred. See, prayer begins with this intimacy as well as, as this idea of, of, of holy. 
in the intimacy later we see that he is a father who can be who can be trusted to be a protector and provider for our needs in Luke chapter 11 and skipping ahead to verses 11 to 13 it says which of you fathers if your son asks for a fish will give him a snake instead or asks for an egg will give him a scorpion if you take uh, if you then though you are evil know how to good give good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Listen, the heavenly father is a good heavenly father and he's not going to trick you. I know that sometimes you use the analogy of father and you might have some father wounds that make it difficult for you to be able to see that God is a good, good father. We sang about it today. God, you're so good, right? And, and what, 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 Jesus is saying here is, listen, you who have a sinful nature, you who are sinners, you, if, you're, if your children come to you and, and they, they say, oh, daddy, daddy, I, I, man, I'm hungry, you wouldn't give them a snake or a scorpion, right? You go, man, that's a bad dad. That's a bad guy. You wouldn't give them a snake or a scorpion. So if you give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your heavenly Father give to those, give to you, give the Holy Spirit to you, right? God's a Father who loves us, and the relationship is both relational and formal, natural and supernatural, imminent and transcendent. Therefore, prayer must begin by recognizing and approaching God from that standpoint of adoration and intimacy. Oh, my Father, my Father, my Father, holy is your name. And you move from adoration to alignment. To alignment. Alignment of what? Alignment of your will with God's will. So you begin by recognizing who God is, that he is both the Father and he is both holy, and that sets the tone for prayer in that way. And then you begin to align your heart with God's heart. Align your heart with God's heart. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you begin to recognize who God is, you begin to trust God and you say, God, I can't see everything that you see and I don't know that everything that you know. And so Lord, as I begin to pray to you, there might be some things that I think I need or some things that I think I want or some things that I think ought to happen my way. Nevertheless, not my will but yours. So through prayer, through this time with you, align my heart with yours. Align my will with yours. See, prayer is transformative. Prayer is, is about aligning with God. Aligning with God. And there is power when we align with God. Oswald Chambers wrote this. It is not so true that prayer changes things as that prayer changes me and then I change things. And he further writes this. Prayer alters a man on the inside, alters his mind and his attitude to things. Prayer isn't about changing God's mind. It's, it's not about changing God's mind. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is good. God is holy. God is righteous. God does what is right. He knows all. He sees all. And he does what is right. Even when his ways are higher than our ways. Right? Even when we don't understand what he's doing. And there are a lot of times, let's just be honest, we don't understand what he's doing. But when you begin to spend time with him and you begin to see the goodness of our God and you begin to commune with him, you will find that he begins to align your heart and your will. And rather than going into prayer to think I'm going to change God's mind, you walk out of your time changed. You walk out changed. And from that point then you can move to asking God for your needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. We open up and we ask what we need. And, and yet we know that God already knows what we need before we ask him, so why do we need to ask him? Because it, it demonstrates trust. It says, God, I'm not self-sufficient. I'm God-sufficient. We've been taught to be self-sufficient. And, and, and while there's, there's nothing wrong with that, 
there, there is a point in time where we need to recognize how sufficient, insufficient we are and how sufficient God is. And that God is the one that is sufficient to meet our needs. And God wants us to come and wants us to ask. You, you, you have not because you ask not. Or you ask with wrong motives. Well, we've already dealt with the wrong motives. If we spend time with God and our prayer time is not so much about changing God's mind, but allowing God to change our mind and our heart, then we come into prayer and God knows what we need, but we cry out and say, oh God, here are my needs. And God meets us. He meets us. He meets us. Oh, but part of aligning ourselves with him is understanding the importance of, here's the next one, forgiveness. Both of our own sins, and for God to help us to forgive others. Right? Oh, forgiveness. Pastor, are you really going to get into that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, because that's that's where this prayer is. Forgive us uh, our debtors as as we have been forgiven, right? There's an element of forgiveness that's important in prayer because sin becomes a barrier to answered prayer. Isaiah 59, 2, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And Jesus put it this way in Mark eleven twenty five: 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. Forgiveness is so important. Both to come to God and admit and confess our sins to a God who is faithful and just and and, and, and able and willing to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We must come to God and say, God, there's a barrier to intimacy with you. And I need to come and I need to ask for your forgiveness. I need you to forgive me. Oh, but God, I live in this broken world. And there are some people who have sinned against me. There are some people that have hurt me, and I don't want to get that lodged in my heart. I don't want to allow bitterness to take root in my life. And so, God, as you have forgiven me, give me the grace to be able to forgive others. Give me the grace to forgive others. Forgiveness is is so incredibly important because resentment, retaliation, and bitterness can dominate our lives if we don't deal with it. Next, Jesus teaches us to pray for protection and strength to resist temptation. Or, in fact, not even to lead us not even into temptation. Lead us not even into temptation. Prayer is so important for that. An example of that is is Peter. He didn't didn't realize how difficult the lure of sin would be and, and how inadequate he would be, his own willpower to overcome it. And so when Jesus is about to face the cross, he he tells Peter, listen, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. And then he takes his disciples into the garden, and they're in the garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is praying and agonizing, and he wants them to pray with him. And he goes back, and what are they doing? (laughs) Sleeping. And, And what is Jesus' advice? Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Listen, if you want to overcome temptation, if you want to have the strength, the spiritual strength to overcome temptation, you've got to develop a prayer habit. A prayer habit is extremely important to empowering you to learn how to align your heart with God's and overcome when temptation comes calling, when the lure of sin comes calling. Finally, Jesus ends the pattern of prayer by teaching them to acknowledge God's kingdom and his power and his glory. You begin with adoration and you close your prayer by remembering God, your kingdom first. God, your kingdom first. God, your power is what we need and your glory is what we seek. Again, keeping our hearts aligned. It's a pattern. So so Jesus modeled prayer And then Jesus taught a pattern for prayer. And then thirdly, Jesus taught them that a prayer habit takes persistence. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend. You go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. Or suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though... 
he will not get up and give you the bread because of the friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. I love that. That's the NIV. Shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Shameless audacity, persistence. That's the habit part. Repeated. Prayer takes persistence. If you want to develop a prayer habit, you've got to develop persistence in your life. There is persistence that is needed in your life to pray and not give up like the widow and the unjust judge. We're encouraged to keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking because if you keep on asking, you will receive. And if you keep on seeking, you will find. And if you keep on knocking, the door will be open to you. Oh, but how many of us Ask once, but don't ask again. How many of us seek, but not far enough? How many of us knock, but not enough? And we miss the open doors that God wants to open for us because we've stopped short of knock, knock, knocking. Knock, knock, knocking. Knock, knock, knocking. There is a persistence in prayer. Not because, again, God is evil. For, God point, for, for Jesus points out, your, your father is not evil, though you are evil. Your father will give good gifts to those who, 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 who seek him. He, he's the giver of good gifts. Look at James, the father of lights, right? He's the giver of good gifts. God is a good father. It's not that God is unjust. So why do we need to be persistent in prayer? Why does God want us to be persistent in prayer? Because prayer does something that strengthens our faith. Prayer internalizes the burden within us. There's, a, there's an internalizing of the bo- burden, and it presses us into deeper intimacy with our Father. Persistence does something to us. It changes us. It transforms us. It matures us. Persistence is important, just like when you are in fitness and your body, and you need to have that resistance And that persistence that breaks down and builds up the muscles so that you have the strength to be able to to, to lift even heavier weights. Persistence is like a a prayer workout. And as we we persist in prayer and develop a a prayer habit, our, our faith muscles will grow as we train for godliness. And we'll be able to trust God for even greater things greater things. Again, persistence is is also necessary as we see the last two points that I want to share. Point number four, prayer habit opens our spiritual eyes. As we persist in prayer and develop a habit of prayer, it opens our spiritual eyes to see what we do not see. Prayer enables us to get in touch with God in such a way that we not only, we, 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 we're not only saying, God, what are you doing? We can begin to see, we can begin to, God opens our eyes to see things we didn't see before. An example is 2 Kings chapter 6, an enemy army had surrounded the city and house of the prophet Elisha. You might remember Elisha was, was a prophet and, and as he was, as an enemy army was coming against, wanting to come against Israel, they were wanting to set up traps. And, 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 and God began to give him visions. He began to be spiritually almost like in the, in the room where, where they were making their plans or the enemy army making their plans. And so he'd go and tell the king and then the king would, would thwart it. And they, the, the enemy army was getting frustrated. We have a spy among us. Who's, who's doing this? And he says, Israel has a prophet. And, and so they sent an army to try to take care of Elisha. And they surround the place where Elisha was. And verse 15 says, When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, Don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed and said, Oh, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire all around. There are things in the natural that cause fear and anxiety. And you and I need a prayer habit so that God can open up our eyes like he did to the servant so that we can begin to see supernaturally that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That we can begin to see I have nothing to fear and I don't have to be anxious about what's happening because my God is still on the throne and my God is still mighty and my God still has power and my God can take care of these things. 
Be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving. Offer your requests to God and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we have an anxious mind. Sometimes we have an anxious heart because we haven't developed a prayer habit where we say, God, open my eyes and let me see you. Open my eyes and let me see what you're doing. Because furthermore, here's number five. Furthermore, a prayer habit leads to breakthrough, open doors, and miracles. Because there is a spiritual world and a spiritual battle that is happening. There is a, a spiritual world that we do not see, that is beyond the natural. And you look at things and you fight these things in the natural and you can't get through. There are things that you're doing in the natural that you think ought to work. The wisdom of this world... But the wisdom of this world oftentimes fails when there are supernatural spiritual things, spiritual attacks of the enemy, strongholds that need to be broken, where the enemy is coming and raising up a standard against what God wants to do. And God uses prayer as a way to break through. God uses prayer as a way to open doors. God uses prayer as a way to tear down strongholds. Prayer is essential in the spiritual battle that we are in. In Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Again, Paul is saying there's a spiritual battle that is going on. We need to learn how to take our stand against the schemes of the enemy. And he, and he lays out the armor of God. But this is what he closes with. And pray in the spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Prayer is powerful because it connects us with God and keeps us alert, not only to the enemy's schemes, but the God-given opportunities that he puts before us. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty, to the pulling down of strongholds. We are anemic as believers and followers of Christ and even as a church because we have not developed a prayer habit in our lives. Prayer makes the difference. Prayer makes the difference. Developing a prayer habit is critical to the follower of Christ to walk in intimacy with God and to walk in the power of God. Often we miss out on the blessing and the treasure because we don't take time to develop a prayer habit. Instead, we make excuses like, I'm too busy to pray. I'm just too busy to pray. Oswald Chamber puts it in perspective for us. Remember, no one has time to pray. We have time for, we have to take time, excuse me, from other things that are valuable in order to understand how necessary prayer is. The things that act like thorns and stings in our personal lives will go away instantly when we pray. We won't feel that smart anymore because we have God's point of view about them. Prayer means that we get into unison with God's view of other people. Friends, we need to prioritize prayer in our personal lives and recognize the power that comes from developing a prayer habit. Worship team, will you come? Friends, Abraham understood the importance and the power involved in prayer. In Genesis 18, we see that when Abraham learned about impending doom and destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah, that he remained standing before the Lord rather than rush out to warn the cities. Nehemiah understood the power of prayer. In Nehemiah 1.4, it says that when advisors had informed him of, of Jerusalem, that it was in ruins and the walls lay in ruins, he laid a foundation of prayer before he ever laid a foundation of stone. And Esther understood the power of prayer before Esther had petitioned King Xerxes to help save the Israelites from impending destruction due to the wicked plan of, of his closest advisor, Haman. She called a fast and prayer for the people as they began to pray before she did anything 
she called people to fast and pray. Before Abraham went out and did anything, he stood before the Lord in prayer. Before Nehemiah ever laid a stone, stood before the Lord in prayer. God is looking for people who will stand before him in prayer. God is looking for people who say, I will develop a prayer habit. I will develop a prayer habit. I will be an intercessor. I will intercede for God. Miracles happen when we pray. Breakthrough happens when we pray. Strongholds come down when we pray. God is calling each and every one of us to develop a prayer habit in our life. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, Holy Spirit, we just come before you right now. And Lord, if we struggle with this area of prayer, we ask right now that Jesus, you would begin to stir in us a desire to spend time with you, a desire to commune with you, a desire to spend time in your presence, interceding and praying and believing God for you to do what we cannot believing for you to align our hearts with yours so that, Father, we can hear your voice. We could see the open doors and the opportunities that you put before us, that you will sensitize our ears as we begin to spend time with you and in time hearing your voice. God, we don't want our prayer time to be simply a monologue, but Father, we also want it to be a dialogue where not only do we cry out to you, but we spend time listening to you and allowing you to align our heart and our will with yours. Father, we know that prayer is not that difficult. It's simple, and yet it's hard in practice. So we pray that you will teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us to seek after you. Teach us to be persistent and not give up. Open our eyes to the things that, that, God, we cannot see. And, Lord, let us lean into you in the battle, trusting you for breakthrough and miracles. We ask you, God, to lead us into your presence and teach us, God, how to pray. In Jesus' name, amen.